So good afternoon. This is lecture 11 of the course entitled Using Vector Calculus to Solve Problems in Electricity and Magnetism. I'm Dr. Richardson. Here's my email address. So again, some administrative issues. Remember, of course, that learning is not a passive activity. Um, in order to understand the concepts and applications, you definitely have to take notes throughout the lectures. Problem sets are essential for this course. You'll get nothing out of the course unless you do the problem sets. And again, it's okay to skip a problem that's difficult and come back to it. Uh, solution sets for, uh, solution set for the last lecture problem set 10 that's been posted on Google Drive um, that was done earlier this week. And I actually posted the solution key to problem set 10 earlier also this week. And again, don't jump to the solution key. You're never gonna learn anything in STEM by just looking at the solutions and working backwards. Now, if you get stuck, what you can do is peek at the solutions and just take a piece of paper and scroll down line by line. It might give you some hints on what to do, but just by looking at the uh, solutions and trying to do reverse engineering, that's not gonna help anybody. Again, I'm available for questions online. Uh, email address is listed and um, I'll try to get back to you within 24 hours. I find a ruler, finally, I find a ruler to be very helpful in um, constructing diagrams and seeing what's going on, getting the geometry right, getting the trigonometry right. And if you haven't already, please acquire a ruler. Okay, so what we're going to do today, <clears throat> a couple of things. I want to spend a few minutes talking about the difference between ideal and real materials in electrostatics. So for the moment, or at least up to now, we've been spending a lot of time talking about charge systems. Um, or we don't want to call them infinite, but <clears throat> excuse me. We've been talking about point charges. So the isolated point charges in space, they generate electric fields given by this expression, which really is Coulomb's law. So all electrostatics really is Coulomb's law. And these charges have no physical uh, um, composition. They're just mathematically point charges. That's how we we've viewed them up to now. And this also tr is true if you have an assembly of point charges. So we haven't spent any time talking about the structure of these point charges. They could have value Q or 2Q, <clears throat> excuse me, or minus 3Q or 17Q but we will ignore, or we have ignored, the structure of these point charges. And again, charges, as we know, can be described in terms of units, and those units are Coulombs, after the inventor of Coulomb's law. So, We've extended this idea throughout this course of either a single point charge or an assembly of point charges to continuous charge distributions. So what does that mean? Well, we have looked at a number of idealized situations. So all these systems are ideal. They're not real, but we just invented them so that the mathematics is easy to do. So in fact, we looked at the case where if you took charge and made it continuous and spread it out over a line, so that you could describe that charge by a linear charge density lambda, uh, 
which has units of coulombs or meters, then that was a very neat thing to do that allowed us to calculate the electric field and the electrostatic potential for lots of systems. But again, this wire or line, we've always looked at as being structureless. Never spent any time talking about, you know, is this actually a physical copper wire? Same thing with a surface of surface charge density sigma that has units of coulombs per meter squared. We never worried about the structure of the material. We just simply said, take a charge distribution, assume it's continuous, and just spread it all out throughout a two-dimensional uh, surface. So that it had units of charge per the area. And the same thing with volume charge density. We looked at it in the case of not paying any attention to a real physical material, but just as an idea where you take a charge and you assume it's continuous and you spread it over some volume. So it's, uh, it's um, volume charge density was rho. <clears throat> It has units of charge per volume. So if you want to find out how much charge you have, you just multiply rho times uh, the volume, or you integrate the ch volume charge density over differential volume elements. So I want to spend a few minutes actually talking about real systems, or at least approximations to real systems. So real systems actually are actually comprised of atoms. And we know that an atom is essentially composed of two parts, an ion, uh, nucleus, a positively charged uh, nucleus, a positively charged region of space, um, which is an ion that has uh, protons in it, it has neutrons in it, and it really has a set of tightly bound electrons in it. So it's strictly speaking something called an ion core. And attached to each ion core is an electron. And these electrons can really have two distinct behaviors. In a real material called an insulator, these electrons are not allowed to go out in the street by themselves. They are bound to these ion cores. So again, essentially an ion core consists of a nucleus, which has protons, neutrons, and a set of electrons called core electrons. And what's left out is an electron that can essentially either be tightly bound to the ion core or not. These typically are called valence electrons in the context of an atom in terms of chemistry. When you put them inside a material, they're known as conduction electrons. Okay. So Insulators are materials that essentially have electrons that are bound to the ion core. So here's a block of an insulator. So what are some examples of insulators? Oh, rubber, glass. These are just made of atoms. These atoms consist of ion cores and bound valence electrons. And so there's nothing happening. There are no, you know, for all intents and purposes, when you apply an external electric field to this system, nothing happens. The electrons that are bound to the ion cores really don't move far away from the ion cores. And this material does not conduct electricity. That's why it's called an insulator. Um, I'll say this just for the moment. You can imagine doing, having an example where you take an insulator and you apply an electric field to it that is extremely strong and it's strong enough that it breaks the electrons away from the ions and it ionizes the material and then the insulator becomes conducting. But that's a very, a very special case. You have to 
use an unusually high electric field or voltage. Remember, electric fields and electrostatic potentials are related to do that. Now, there's another type of real material that we really haven't spent any time talking about. We have in a very subtle case for a capacitor, but I want to come back to that. And that's a conductor or a metallic conductor. So what happens in a conductor or a metallic conductor is that one or more electrons that are associated with an atom are free to roam. throughout the solid. So hence the term conductor, uh, this metal can carry current. We haven't said anything about current in this course, and we probably won't have time to, but current is what happens when you have a charge that's allowed to move in time and it's given by the symbol i sometimes electrical engineers use j because they don't want to confuse i with um the square root of minus one now conductors in general are not perfect so again this is a idealized system but you can imagine a material that had a unlimited supply of free charges. And again, going back to our plan of drawing pictures. So inside your metallic conductor or conductor, or metal, you have the case where these electrons are no longer bound to these ion cores and they're free to roam around the material. So examples of conductors, copper, gold, silver, nickel. Okay. And clearly in the presence of some external electric field, these electrons will obey Coulomb's law and react accordingly and move. So you can imagine a current occurring inside your conductor. So perfect conductors don't exist, but metallic conductors do. Um, the supply of free charges is not infinite or unlimited. Um, and it's nice to talk about perfect conductors, but uh, again, they are approximation. So let us focus on what happens if you apply the ideas of electrostatics to ideal conductors. So we're going to look through a couple of, look at a number of cases, number of systems. So case one. Here is a ideal conductor of arbitrary shape, and there are a couple of interesting things you can say about this ideal conductor. That when you're looking at electrostatics, the electric field inside this ideal conductor must be zero. So the electric field inside a, and I'm not going to keep saying ideal conductor, 
it's assumed when I say conductor, I'm assuming it's ideal, at least at this level. So the electric field inside a conductor must vanish. And there are two ways to see that. One rough and tumble way is, is to look at the case where suppose the electric field were not a, a, a zero inside a conductor. We know the conductors are comprised of electrons that can move, so there are free charges. And if the electric field were not zero inside a conductor, according to Coulomb's law, the free charges would move. And we really would not have electrostatics. It wouldn't be a problem in electrostatics anymore. Electrostatics, again, is the field of electricity and magnetism where you assume that the charges are fixed and not moving. Now, you know, you can think about that for a moment. That's sort of a, a solution to first order, but it's really not satisfactory. And there's actually a better explanation. And you can see how that works in this simple diagram. So suppose you have a piece of a, a, an ideal conductor or a metal, and you place it in the presence of an external electric field, E naught. Well, what's going to happen? Inside this material, again, the electric field goes from left to right, so that means that it's generated by a positive charge. The convention for electric field, according to Gauss's law, is that it goes outward from a positive point charge. So if you're a free electron inside this ideal conductor, you're going to move, and you're going to move to the left because you're going to see an electric field that Coulomb's law says hey, I have to move to the left, okay? I'm attracted to the positive source of E naught. And move in those electrons, once those electrons move to the left of the conductor, they tr create atoms that have a deficit of electrons or positive charges. So what's happening is that you are setting up inside this conductor a new field, some induced field, E sub 1. And it simply arises from the fact that if electrons accumulate on the left-hand side of the conductor and you have positive ions on the right-hand side of the conductor, there's an electric field that points in the opposite direction. And this process goes on until you reach a point where the external electric field is completely canceled out by this internal electric field E sub 1. And this process actually happens extremely fast. So the key idea here, here the key part of physics, the key part of the physics is that the induced charges produce a field which we call E sub 1, which cancels out E sub naught inside the solid or conductor. Now, I'm being a little sloppy here um, when I say that the positive charges inside go to the right and the negative charges go to the left. What really happens is that the electrons move, but once they move, they leave ion cores which are positively charged. So the mobile carriers inside a conductor are really electrons. 
the ion cores are not moving. So you can see that D really is a clearer idea or clearer explanation of the observation that when you have a ideal conductor, you can't have an electrostatics and electric field inside of it. Okay, other observations to make about ideal conductors and electrostatics. So I'll keep my figure as an arbitrarily shaped ideal conductor. And second observation I can make is that Gauss's law is always gonna be something that's helpful, tells you something. The flux of the electric field through some Closed surface equals the charge enclosed divided by the permittivity of free space. But if the electric field vanishes inside a conductor, then Gauss's law tells you that inside the conductor, there are no free charges. Now be careful about that. You could have a volume charge density which is positive inside the conductor. So charges still could be around, they don't disappear. But you could have, but this observation tells you the volume charge density due to the positive charge carriers added to the volume charge density of negative charge carriers is some total. And if you have a conductor where the electric field is zero inside the conductor, then it's the total volume charge density, a total number of charges that must vanish inside the conductor. So inside the conductor rho, the volume charge density is zero. Okay, so this leads to the next obvious question to ask. And again, we'll keep our system. Here's a picture of our, a piece of our ideal conductor. The third question we want to ask about this system, uh, we're trying to figure out what are the consequences for ideal conductors when you take into account everything we've discussed about electrostatics. So if you charge up, a conductor where does the excess charge excess or net it's another where does the excess or net charge go and the answer is has to go to the surface. That's the only place left because there are no free charges inside the bulk of the material. So in fact, when you put excess charge on an ideal conductor, that excess charge goes to the surface of the conductor. 
in this system here in this schematic, I'm placing an excess charge on the conductor and it's spread out uniformly over the surface. So it generates electric field vectors that come out from the surface. How they come out, we'll say a little bit more about that next lecture. But there clearly is no electric field inside the conductor. There's an electric field outside the conductor. So if you sprinkle charge over a real system, not an ideal system that we've been talking about heretofore, but a real conducting sphere. It is uniformly spread over the surface. That's an interesting observation. Okay, so last lecture we started to talk about capacitors. And capacitors are devices or systems that allow you to store electric charge. And they store electric charge on the surface. So capacitors are really made of conductors, ideal conductors, metals. And capacitors store electric charge on the surface of the conductor simply because that is the only place excess charge and reside. So if you just take a finite piece of metal or conductor, you can imagine having an isolated single capacitor Excuse me, how is that? Well, the excess charge, you somehow take this piece of metal and you attach to it some excess charge. Since you have charge, you have a potential at that plate. So this plate as charge, excess charge Q, and it has a potential. I'm going to stop using the term electrostatic potential because there was a lot of words and just simply call this the potential. And that's what most people do. And if I have a situation where it's not clear what I'm talking about, something like a vector potential, we'll not talk about that in this course, then I'll spell it out. But when I say potential, I just mean electrostatic potential. And anytime you have an electrostatic potential, you have to have a reference. So the potential is zero at infinity. So there's clearly got to be a relationship between the charge that you put in this isolated single capacitor and the potential that the plate is at. That proportionality constant is none other than the capacitance. And we talked last lecture about how to in fact calculate that. But again, um, we didn't emphasize that these capacitors are really made of real materials, ideal conductors. Say a little bit more about capacitors. Mm -hmm. 
what we did was not just take one plate, but two plates, and again, put excess charge somehow on one plate. And let's say you either have positive charges on the other plate, or you have some depletion of negative charges, which leaves positive ion cores. Both pictures are similar. Note, this is our friend, the parallel plate capacitor. And it's neutral. The entire system is neutral. Total charge is neutral. Couple of things, these two plates are oppositely charged, so they clearly will attract each other. So you have to build your capacitor to fight this attractive force. You can actually calculate what this attractive force is. And you can imagine connecting these metal plates to a battery. And all a battery is, is something that allows charge to flow. So you can change the potential difference between those two plates and change the amount of charge stored on a plate. So when we talk about the capacitance of a two plate parallel capacitor, we really mean when we talk about the Q in this denominator, denominator simply the plate, the charge on a single plate. Because after all, the entire system is electrically neutral. So the key idea is that you need to think about capacitors a little bit more carefully because they're not really made of materials that are ideal. They are actually are made of metal, metallic conductors. In this case, perfect conductors, metals. Okay. And again, capacitors don't have to have the shapes, shapes of parallel plates. You can imagine arbitrarily taking two different materials and having them have very bizarre shapes and applying a excess charge Q1 on one and a charge Q2 on the other. These systems are conductors, they're metals, and they clearly have a voltage or voltage difference that you can assign to each one of them by letting the electrostatic potential vanish at infinity and each one of these systems has a capacitance. Okay. So capacitors are really the first instance where we start to think about what is it that the material is actually made of. And we have to get away from this idea, idea of an idealized charge distribution and recognize that these materials are metals where you have free electrons inside and ion cores, and you have to deal with them, and also how they behave in the presence of some external field. Okay, so most of today's lecture, I wanna focus on another example of how electrostatics works. And I wanna talk about electric dipoles. Not going to say everything we need to say about electric dipoles, but um, we'll say a lot. So first of all, remember point charges. If you have an isolated point charge Q, then it generates an electrostatic potential or potential. I kept saying that we're going to stop using the term electrostatic potential. That potential is a scalar. It's a scalar field, a scalar function. It goes like one over a distance. So you expect to see a potential due to a single point charge 
And then you can calculate the electric field anywhere in space by just taking minus the gradient of that electrostatic potential or potential. And we've gone through many examples of how to do that. So let me consider the following system. So this is a new system. It's not a system with a single point charge. But let me have a system where I have a point charge, which is Q, and a point charge, which is minus Q. And note, this system is neutral, right? Because Q minus Q is zero. So this, the total charge of this system is zero. And you might expect since the total charge of the system is zero, you might expect the electrostatic potential or potential at some distance away from the system to be zero, and you might expect the electric field to be zero. Because after all, you have two different source charges, they're oppositely charged, so, you know, you don't have a source charge that has a Q. You have a source char charge that's Q minus Q. So, you know, what's the big deal? You don't expect to see any potential or electric field. Well, it turns out that's not really right. It's not really right at all. So we have to look at this system very carefully and see what's going on. And we'll do that now. So suppose you have a charge Q and a charge minus Q, and they're separated by a distance D, so that the distance from Q to the origin is D over two, and the distance from minus Q to the origin is D over two. Okay, I put my origin there so that I can define any other vectors I wanna worry about. So suppose I have a vector r and its head lands at a point p. And the question I want to ask is, what is, again, I'm not going to say electrostatic potential, you know, but that's what I'm talking about. What is the potential at point p? And is it really zero? So I have to be very careful how I analyze this problem. So it's clear that there is a vector, which I'll call R sub one, that goes from Q to point P. And similarly, let's get this guy out the way so it doesn't block up traffic. There's gonna be another vector that goes from minus Q to P, and I'll call that vector R sub two. And this is just a vector r. And I've defined everything I need to to analyze this system. But recognize there are two point or two sources or two point sources of charge. Therefore, there are two potentials, V sub one and V sub two. There's a potential at P due to charge uh, Q sub one, which we'll call this guy. And there's a potential due to charge Q sub two, which has the value of minus Q. So the principle of superposition tells you if you want to find the total potential at point P, you just calculate those guys separately and add it up. So let's do that. One of those potentials, I could call this V sub one, but I'm gonna stop using that subscript. It's just gonna be Q over four pi epsilon, not R sub one. And I need to find two things. One thing I already know, Q. That's just this guy. And the other thing I need to figure out is what is R sub one. So if I look at this picture, 
Again, I'm going to use a, a time honored trick, namely the law of cosines. I will define an angle, theta, and having defined that angle, I get a triangle, which I can use the law of cosines to, apply the law of cosines to, and that'll tell me that R1 squared is simply going to be D over two squared plus R squared minus two times R times D over two times the cosine of theta. So I'm now in a position to actually write R sub one in terms of R, D, and theta, given the geometry of that problem. So R sub one squared, I can factor out R squared and I'll get one plus D squared over four R squared minus D cosine theta over R. And suppose my point P is a point such that it's pretty far away from the separation distance between those two charges Q and minus Q. So if R is much, much greater than D, R squared is certainly much greater than D squared, and D squared over four R squared can be ignored in this approximation. So in that case, R sub one is just R times one minus D cosine theta, over r to the one half power and one over r sub one is just one over r times one minus d over r cosine theta to the one half power now i can simplify this expression by using the binomial series, namely one plus x to the alpha power can be approximated as one plus alpha x plus alpha x squared over two plus higher order terms, where alpha here is not an integer. So using the binomial series is just simply a Taylor series, right? So using that approximation, one over R squared is approximately one over R times one plus D over two R cosine theta. Okay, I've gotten rid of this exponent, this negative exponent by just using a Taylor series. So I really have my answer. The total electric, the total electrostatic potential or potential at point P due to the principle of superposition is the sum of these two. One of them is Q over four pi epsilon naught R sub one. And the other is Q over four pi epsilon naught R sub two. This minus sign comes from the fact that Q sub two is negatively charged. And for the approximations I've used so far, namely for distances far away, or distances greater than the separation 
distance d between these two charges, I have found that v sub bar is approximately q over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over r 1 minus d to r cosine theta. So I found that for my charge q sub 1. And there's also the term, so this guy deals with that. What I have not done in this example, but I'll leave it up to you in problem set 11 to prove, is that if you look at V sub two, it has a contribution. Again, valid only in this approximation that you're looking at distances are greater than D. And you have a similar term, but here you have a, actually this is a positive sign, here you have a minus sign, d over 2r cosine theta. So you can put all these two together and you'll discover that you'll have an expression that goes like q over 4 pi epsilon naught d divided by r squared cosine theta. Again, this is an approximation. So let's stop and ask ourselves, does this expression make sense? Yeah, d is a distance, it has units of meters, r squared is meters squared, so I have one over a distance there. So I have coulombs over a distance, those are the right units for an electrostatic potential if I ignore the permittivity of free space. I'm going to take this expression and play with it for a few minutes. Short time period in that. I'm going to define a vector P that in fact is has a magnitude D and points in the direction R hat. So again, go back to my diagram. Um, I have my two point charges, Q and minus Q, they're separated by distance D. And I'm gonna use a convention that everybody uses, that in fact, my vector P points from my minus charge to my plus charge. So I can rewrite this electrostatic potential as one over four pi epsilon naught times P dotted into R hat. Um, let's see, I misspoke here. I don't mean this. I mean in a minute, divided by R squared. So some definitions are needed here. The vector P is something we'll call the dipole moment. And what I said before is true. P points in a direction that starts where the minus charge is and ends up where the positive charge is. And it's a vector. Now, let me correct what I just said erroneously a few uh, 20 seconds ago. R hat is simply a unit radial vector. But as we've seen before in our discussion of vector analysis, it simply just points in the direction of the position vector, R. Okay. So when you take P, Okay, this is a little sloppy. My dipole moment is going to be my vector 
it's a vector that points in a certain direction. In this case, let's say that's the k hat direction. It is the product of a distance and a charge. So And then when I take the dot product of those two guys in the numerator, I simply get d k hat dotted into r hat. I get a charge of a four pi epsilon naught r squared in the denominator. And the dot product of k hat with r hat is simply the cosine of the angle between them. So let's review all this a little bit more carefully. Let's go back to our original picture. Pictures are always useful. Here's my charge Q. Here's my charge minus Q. They are separated by a distance D. Here's my origin. And here is R. And this is the point at which I want to evaluate the electrostatic potential. This is the k-hat direction. This is my angle theta. D is a vector that has magnitude and direction. And the convention is it points from the minus, it points in the positive k-hat direction. And it points from uh, the minus charge to the positive charge. P is my dipole moment. It is the magnitude of D times Q. And again, it points in the same direction as D. And its convention is that it's a vector that goes from minus q to plus q. Finally, r hat is the radial unit vector associated with the position vector r. So what we found is that v, the electrostatic potential at point p, is just q divided by epsilon naught, 4 pi, d, cosine theta divided by r squared. And you can write that in a much more convenient form. If you invent this dipole moment vector, which we have here, and take the dot product of it with the radial unit vector. And of course, I have an r squared in the denominator. So what are the units of the dipole moment? Dipole moment is something that has units of distance times charge. Now, I'm gonna call this electric potential a dipole potential. And I'm going to replace what was an approximation by an equal sign. Because if I just worry about this one moment, then I have what I have. I have the dipole potential, and it's generated by an expression. And I got this guy by making some approximations. You don't want to make those approximations. Life gets a little bit more complicated or interesting. And I'll defer that to the next problem set. So let's just stop for a minute and realize that there's something in this discussion that we really haven't addressed that's quite unphysical. I have my two point charges separated by a distance d. 
And then, then I go merrily on my way to calculate the electrostatic potential due to those two point charges. Well, wait a minute. If I just have those two point charges in space, they attract each other. So this system will collapse in and on itself. Unless I hold these guys, Q and minus Q, fixed in space. And you may say, well, isn't that kind of artificial? And it is to some extent, but there actually are physical examples of this dipole in nature. And you really don't have to go any further than elementary chemistry. So for example, there is a molecule carbon monoxide. It's highly poisonous. have special detectors in your home or apartment that let you know if the amount of carbon monoxide is gets to the point that's lethal in the air. Oxygen tends to be an element that is more electronegative than carbon. So in fact, the carbon monoxide molecule, molecule is a physical example of a dipole. And the dipole moment goes from positive, from negative to positive. So it's a vector indicated as such. And the carbon monoxide molecule, this bond between the carbon and oxygen, is a triple bond. It's fixed. So this is actually a real physical example of a dipole. And the dipole moment. Contrast that with carbon dioxide which is a major culprit of all the problems we're experiencing with climate change, and something is a little different. Yeah, uh, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, but you have two opposing forces here. So in fact, the dipole moment for carbon dioxide is zero. So the carbon monoxide molecule behaves exactly like a system where you have two pieces of charge, two charges separated by some fixed distance. And in this case, the dipole moment is zero, whereas for carbon monoxide, it's not zero. One last example, water, and this is an extremely important example, has a dipole moment, fortunately. If it did not, we would not have life on this planet. Oxygen tends to be negatively charged. Hydrogen, uh, hydrogen has, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, but the structure of the water molecule is not that it's linear. It's not like carbon dioxide. So this system does have a dipole moment, and that's a good thing because it allows water to be an excellent solvent for many, many things. Okay, so back to the question at hand. We know the potential of the dipole. is, you can write it in two ways, Q over four pi epsilon naught, D over R squared cosine theta, or you can write it more elegantly by inventing this thing called a dipole moment, where you have your factor one over four pi epsilon naught, and then you have P dotted into R hat, R squared, where P is the dipole moment. It is a vector, so you have to tell people what direction it points. It has magnitude of QD, so a charge times a separation, has units of Coulomb's length, and in the example that we looked at, it points in the positive k-hat direction. So the next question we can ask, using electrostatics, is given the dipole moment potential, what is the electric field? 
generated by this system of two charges. And again, I said that on the onset of this discussion, that the electrostatic potential and the electric field need not vanish if you're far away from the charge distribution. If you're infinitely far away, of course they'll vanish because the dipole potential goes like one over r squared. If r goes to infinity, the potential goes to zero. But I'm not talking about distances, infinite distances from my set of two point charges. I'm talking about distances far away, but not infinitely far away, 10 meters, 100 meters, 1,000 meters. OK, I know how to calculate this electric field now, given the potential. So I can calculate a dipole field. And the way I do that is just the standard procedure. I take minus the gradient of the dipole potential. And I'm going to leave this to you to prove in problem set 11 that, in fact, the electric field due to my dipole is going to be one that depends upon position and angle. So I'm going to do this in spherical polar coordinates. And I can write it as the magnitude of the dipole moment divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed. That looks kind of strange. We'll come back to that in a minute. 2 cosine theta r hat plus sine theta, theta hat. Why does this look strange? Well, I've got a meters cubed in the denominator, but remember that the dipole moment goes like charge times the distance. So when these two meet each other, you get something that goes like the one over r squared. So the electric field has the right units. So again, the electric field is something that you can generate. You can actually plot this. And I'm not going to do this in lecture, but I'm going to leave this to the problem set. I'll show you some nice, interesting pictures of what the electric field looks like for a dipole moment. So again, let's summarize. My dipole moment due to those two point charges, Q and Q prime separated by a distance D, where these two charges are, have an opposite charge. Q1 is Q, Q2 is minus Q. This dipole moment generates a electrostatic potential or a potential everywhere in space. And you can in fact, calculate the electrostatic potential everywhere in space. We did that. And you can also calculate and visualize what the electrostatic potential is. And it turns out that the easiest way to do this is using spherical polar coordinates. So like most physical problems, you must select, if you want to interpret these results, a particular coordinate system. Because after all, you have to tell the audience where the dipole moment is. It's a vector. You have to tell them what direction it's pointing. And you also have to specify where the position vector is in three dimensions. And the easiest way to do that is using spherical polar coordinates. OK. So now that I have this idea of a dipole moment, I want to go back and look at my discussion of energy and apply it to this problem. <clears throat> 
by asking the following question. What is the energy of a dipole moment in the presence or in an external uniform electric field. Here's a dipole moment specified by a vector P. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a charge times a distance. And that distance can be written as a vector. You have to tell me, of course, what coordinate system to express this. But this is my definition of a dipole moment. Charge has units of coulombs distance meters, so a dipole moment has units of charge per meter. So I want to take this dipole moment and place it in some external electric field. And I want to figure out what the energy is of that, elect of that dipole moment. Now, a couple of things in this problem, I'm going to ignore the electric field generated by the dipole moment itself. So there are two potential electric fields in this problem. There's an external electric field that I'm going to put the dipole moment in, and then there is an electric field that the dipole moment also generates. But I'm going to ignore that for the moment. So if I really am going to tackle this problem, I need to review some things in elementary mechanics. I think it's useful to do that. I'll do that here, and then we'll be ready to tackle this problem. So in elementary mechanics, the key thing is that points can be described by position vectors. R. These position vectors depend upon time. And so if I break this up into Cartesian coordinates, I have i hat times x, which depends on time, times plus j hat times y, that's also time dependent, plus k hat times z, which again is a scalar field that's time dependent. I can get a velocity vector by just taking the derivative of the position vector. I can get an acceleration vector by just taking the derivative of the velocity vector. And that's just the second derivative of the position vector with respect to time. So the key idea of mechanics is Newton's equation of motion, which would be and there's the mass of an object times its acceleration. That's just the second derivative of the position vector with respect to time. That equals some external force applied to the system. So that's a much more sophisticated way of writing F equals MA. I want to rewrite that. I want to rewrite Newton's second equation of motion. So it originally looks like the mass times the second derivative of the position vector with respect to time, and that equals the force. I want to rewrite that by taking the cross product of both sides with the fact but taking the vector r and taking its cross product with both sides of this equation. So the left hand side becomes in the mass times its quantity and parentheses, and the right-hand side is this creature. So, it is 
easy to show. Famous last words. I'll leave this to you for a problem set. It's easy to show that in fact, you can rewrite this as the mass times the derivative with respect to time of this quantity, the position vector crossed into the velocity vector. And the right hand side is still the same. This quantity here to keep this. So this is a, something I want you to prove and show. And so you can finally rewrite Newton's second equation of motion as this quantity r cross v, take its time derivative, multiply by the mass, and that equals r cross uh, f. In this derivation, I'm assuming the mass is not variable, but it's constant. It doesn't change in time. Okay, so I've gone to the trouble of rewriting Newton's equa second equation of motion for a reason. This thing here is simply something that can be simplified by pulling in the mass inside that time derivative. Again, the mass is constant. This thing we will call the angular momentum, L. This object on the right-hand side, R crossed into F, will give this a name also, and we'll call it the torque. So one of the things that you can get from Newton's second equation of motion is the following expression. Namely, the time derivative of the angular momentum of a system is equal to the torque on the system. So this is a very useful way to simplify and see what's happening here. If your force in the problem is what's called a central force, I need to define what a central force is. A central force is just a force that's proportional to the positional vector. If that's true, then the cross product of F clearly must vanish. Or for central forces, the derivative of the angular momentum has to be zero, or the angular momentum L is always conserved. It's always a constant when you have a problem involving a central force, such as Coulomb's law or Newton's law of gravitation. So I find it useful, and I hope you will too, to come up with a nice little table that allows us to put all of this information together from elementary mechanics. So this is going to be a summary of what we should know from elementary mechanics. So if you just have the motion of objects in one path, that's called rectilinear motion. The key thing you have to worry about is that there is a position vector, or if you're just doing this in one dimension, 
there's a position coordinate x. Rect rectilinear motion is not the only type of motion that you can have in mechanics. You can have a system that's allowed to rotate about an angle or axis in a problem. And in that case, the relevant variable that you have to worry about is not this position x, but the angular position theta. In rectilinear motion, you have a velocity that you have to worry about. And that's simply, I don't need these columns anymore. The velocity is just the time derivative of the position vector. Well, in rotational physics, rotational mechanics, the analogous quantity is the angular velocity. It's the time derivative of theta, or sometimes omega, where this has units of radians per second. For rectilinear motion, I have this idea of a force. Again, it's a vector. It can be decomposed into its components. When I have the problem of objects rotating about an axis, the, uh, the uh, um, comparable variable is something called the torque. It's a vector and it has components, but you have to specify about what axis you're rotating. So if you're rotating around the Z axis, then the torque will have a component N sub Z. Rectilinear motion, you have masses. Point charges have masses. For objects that rotate, the relevant variable is not the mass, it's the moment of inertia. It has the symbol I. It's a vector, actually it's a tensor, but it's, it's defined with respect to some axis such as same thing as a torque. Let's call that z-axis. Then finally, from elementary mechanics, we're used to this idea of a linear momentum. It is the product of the mass times the velocity of the object, point particle. The velocity of the object is just the time derivative of the position. And again, I'm just writing this out in one dimension. You can extend these objects, these concepts to three dimensions. For rotational, an object that's rotating, there is a similar concept, and that's the angular moment, momentum of the object. We know what that is. Okay. You said it's the cross product of the position vector with the linear momentum. But in rotation mechanics, what that really is, is the, the thing that replaces the mass is the moment of inertia. And the thing that replaces the velocity is the angular velocity. So in rotational physics, the angular momentum replaces the linear momentum the moment of inertia replaces the mass, and the angular velocity replaces the velocity or linear velocity. And that really ends our review of elementary mechanics. So now we're in a position to set up the problem we want to discuss. what happens. So imagine you have a system of two point charges, Q and minus Q. And let's just call this minus Q and this plus Q. 
And let's say they're separated by distance d. So this is a dipole. Dipole is given by a vector p. It's a charge q, q times a vector d. And again, the convention is the dipole moment p will point from minus charge to the positive charge. Now, in this particular problem, I'm actually going to make this distance between these two point charges fixed. And I'm going to assert in my problem a physical rod of distance d. So the question I want to ask is, what is this system going to do in the presence of some external uniform electric field? Okay. My physical system. And I want to know what is going to be the effect of this external electric field. So this is uniform and constant. And it's denoted by vectors. Electric field is a vector field. What is it going to do to this dipole? So I know the answer. Coulomb tells me that the force on Q prime, which I'll call S sub Q, is just Q times E. E is the same everywhere in space. The force on minus Q, which I'll call F sub minus, is going to be minus Q times E. The total force on my dipole I can calculate by just adding these two creatures together. And you can see by just doing the vector analysis is that that's going to be zero. The torque on this system is just R cross F. R is a vector that's in the direction of my dipole moment, D. The force has the same direction of the electric field. So R and F are vectors that both point in the same direction. So when you take their cross product, the angle between them is zero, the sine is zero, so the torque of the system is zero. So the net force and torque on this electric dipole or this dipole in this particular orientation is zero. So mechanics tells you that nothing is going to happen physically to this system. Well, we used all this time to come up with all this elegant, with an elegant discussion of mechanics. There must be a reason why we did this. Well, there is. Suppose you look at a different system. Suppose you rotate your dipole such that it is no longer collinear with the external electric field. Here's my origin. These charges Q and Q prime are separated by a rigid rod of length D. And the question I want to ask now is, well, I'll put in some more uh, geometrical factors. Let me call the distance from the origin to Q. Okay. Let me designate that by the vector R sub plus 
And let me designate the vector from the origin to minus Q as R sub minus. So two questions I want to ask. What is the one question at a time? What's the net force on my dipole? Again, my electric field is uniform and constant everywhere. Well, the net force, there is a force on the charge Q prime. It's just Q times E. There's a force on the charge minus Q, which we call F sub minus. That's minus Q E. Again, go back to the diagram. Even though I've rotated this system, the forces on those two charges are just equal and opposite. They're equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So when I add them up, I get zero. Let me ask, what is the net torque? On my dipole. I know how to calculate that. The torque on a dipole is just a distance crossed into a force. So there are two contributions to the torque. One is due to Q the positive charge Q, so there's a torque there. It's calculated by taking the position vector R sub plus and crossing it into the force at that charge, which we'll call F sub plus. And there's a similar contribution to the torque R sub minus crossed into F sub minus. I will leave it up to you to show in problem set 11 that when you actually calculate what this is in terms of the geometry of this system, the torque on this dipole is not zero. It is in fact a cross product of the dipole moment with the electric field. Let's check the units to see if everything is okay. The electric field is going to go like one over a distance. The dipole moment is going to go like a distance. So this, uh, your torque really is going to, actually I'm going to leave this to you to show. Your torque should actually have units of force times a distance. I don't want to write Newtons there because that N has the possible confusion of being uh, mistaken for a torque N. So there are two things that you'll need to do in problem set 11. You'll need to prove this expression and you'll need to do a dimensional analysis to show that it makes sense. Okay. All right, so let's summarize. Um, what I want to do next is I want to continue, I'll do this next lecture, a discussion of what this thing actually means telling you something. It's not just an equation that you write in space. It's telling you something. It's going to tell you something about, in fact, the energy of the dipole in some external electric field.
Um, the next thing we'll do next time is wrap up some of our vector calculus to state, we won't prove them, but some extremely useful theorems. Stokes theorem and the divergence theorem. And then we're going to apply these to electrostatics. You could make an argument that the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem were things that we should have discussed back in lecture one and two and three. And some lecturers and some authors do that, and I chose not to. I wanted to go through a number of examples of uh, setting up the vector analysis, the review of coordinate systems, applying and seeing how vector calculus works, and then applying it to a, a, a cast of problems using Coulomb's law using the electric field and the electrostatic potential and calculating electric field and electrostatic potential in a number of examples. Now that we've done that and we've got some confidence of how that works, we can now go back and look at what vector calculus tells us about electrostatics from a higher level using the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem. They sound like very scary theorems. It turns out they're not. They have very simple physical meanings and ways that they can be interpreted. And as advertised, um, we won't get to this next lecture, but we'll do this in the final lecture, lecture 13. I do want to say something about magnetism. Though I won't say as much about magnetism as I've said about electrostatics. So next lecture will be lecture 12. We'll continue the discussion of dipoles and electric fields. So then talk about a review of electrostatics from the point of view of the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem. We'll do both of those next week. Lecture 12. And then our final lecture, say something about magnetism. What happens when you have point charges that move? Um, what are magnetic fields? What are the forces due to a magnetic field? Can a magnetic field do work on a system? Those are all questions that we will address in the next two lectures. So the problem set for this lecture, lecture 11, this should be available online on the Google Drive site um, by no later by next, by next Tuesday. Perhaps you may be up there even before then. OK, um, any questions? So if not, that concludes lecture um, 11.